Sorry, uh, my name is Dr. Ron Weisberger. I'm the uh, director of the Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, as I like to say, we're, there's only three in the state, these centers, us, Salem State, and uh, UMass Amherst. So we're the only community college with a, a center. The closest one is uh, there's also the Bornstein Center in Providence. Some of you may know of it, but in any case, <coughs> We are uh, working to promote Holocaust and genocide education, which I think most of you know has become more and more important. It always was important, but it's even more important. Um, anyway, I'm really happy to um, see you all here. I hope everybody got to eat some and have wine, but after, uh, please stay a little bit, just more wine and still food. There's also raffle, I know people have done raffling, but uh, I was told that right afterwards they'll, choose, they'll do the raffle, so don't leave. You have to be here in order to collect your, your package, right? So uh, don't run away. Um, this, and this is the first fundraising event we've had, you know, it's been the COVID time, but I'm glad to see everybody in person. Um, we have our very exciting, uh, wonderful program planned for this evening that I think you'll find very moving. Um, the idea for this event was inspired by our button campaign in which we have actually collected 1.5 million buttons, um, which commemorates the number of ch Jewish children who were murdered during the Holocaust. It's hard to envision that, but each button represents a child. <clears throat> we've actually collected, and most of them, um, I think we've, we've counted about a million and we have our uh, students from our honors program is helping us count the rest of, and s some other volunteers, the rest of the uh, buttons. And then we're hoping to um, build some sort of monument on campus using the buttons. And we're working in that. We have an artist that we're talking to. So anyway, um, but some of these buttons were used too to create portraits of Anne Frank and Stephen Ross, you know Anne Frank and Steve, Stephen Ross was a uh, survivor. Um, most of their portraits are in the lobby. Of course, you can see them on the cover of our program. Um, they were uh, built, uh, developed a couple years ago by um, our art department. M M Marissa Millard is professor of craft graphic design along with a number of her students created these amazing portraits. Uh, we're hoping to do another portrait this summer, but we're also, as I said, working on a monument. But, um, so those buttons are there to represent those children who were murdered, but we want to make sure that they're not forgotten as best we can. Um, the portraits gained the attention of, of many people who've been through here over the last couple years, including Mark Ludwig, who's the executive director of the Tretzen Foundation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to amplifying the musical legacy of the artists imprisoned in Theresienstadt, which was a World War II Nazi concentration camp, and you'll hear more about that from Mark. Anyway, Mark, who was previously a violist with the Boston Symphony, has presented several programs here at the college in the past, including recently his recent published book, Our Will to Live, which is an incredible book, and actually we have some of those books available Afterwards, if any of you want to purchase it, Mark mentioned that half the proceeds he will give to our center. But it's, I've read the book and it's an amazing book. Um, anyway, when Mark saw these portraits, a conversation began about collaborating on the future uh, musical program, which was inspired by these portraits. And tonight is the result of that collaboration. And um, we're very, um, indebted to Mark for the support and the people, you know, and the Theresen Foundation. They recently had their own <coughs> fundraising, which myself and some of our students attended uh, a couple weeks ago in at Boston Symphony, uh, where the Boston Symphony plays, whatever that place is called. <laughs> um, I want to, um, before we begin though, as, as usual, I want to thank a few people. First of all, I want to thank the, the event planning committees, committee 
who have spent many hours, really many hours working to make this event a success. So I want to thank Robin Worthington, Rebecca Sodebarn, uh, Emily Brown, Kate Rose, Colleen Abedikian, Manya Bark, and Judy Brown, all in part of our advisory committee, but this is a subcommittee that's worked um, to make this happen. Um, we also have a group of student volunteers from our honors program who is assisting. And we also have some volunteers from high school students, you may have seen them, who are also helping us. Um, in addition, I wanted to thank our advisory board as a whole, and you can see their names on the back of our program. Uh, without our advisory committee, none of this could occur. So I'm very appreciative of, of the time they put in. Um, I'd also want to thank Judy Uckhart, who's the chief development officer here at the college, part of the uh, Bristol Foundation. Um, she, her support was amazing in making sure that information got out. Uh, and this is the result. So thank you, Judy, for that. Also, we want to thank our corporate sponsors, and you can see their names on the back of the program. Again, um, without their support, we couldn't do what we're doing. Uh, we're also grateful for you for coming here, right? It's part of our fundraising efforts. Um, lastly, I want to thank President Laura Douglas, who is here, uh, and the administration, faculty, and staff of Bristol Community College for their unwavering support of our mission to provide educational, professional development, community programming, and um, arts-related programming, all related to our, um, Genesis, our center. And uh, one of the big things that we're doing is um, uh, working with regional teachers. And, uh, and we have Gary Brown and Marsha Over is, is here, who's on our a committee to uh, work together with teachers. So anyway, um, I want to introduce our president, uh, Laura Douglas, who has a few words to say before we start the program. Thank you so much, uh, Ron. This is a, a wonderful event, and it is so great to be back in person after all of these years. You know, it's, uh, I want to give a special thank you to uh, Dr. Weisberger for carrying on during the, during the pandemic and making sure that we kept our programming uh, going, that we kept contact with our donors. Uh, this is such an important center, our Holocaust and Genocide Center. Our work is, is constant, it's daily, and it did not stop during the pandemic. So let's give Dr. Weisberger a big round of support. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you for coming out today. Thank you for donating to a very important cause. Uh, your gift today in coming out today and supporting our Holocaust and Genocide Center supports the very important programming that we do, not only for our community at large, but for Bristol Community College, our students, our faculty and staff, and also for the teacher education programs that happen in our community. Your support allows us to educate our teachers to be able to teach about the Holocaust and to be able to teach about genocide and to really create awareness for our young people in our community. It would be nice if we could say, well, you know, genocide doesn't happen anymore, but we all know that genocide is alive in our world today. And it is a sad commentary for our existence as human beings, but I believe through the work that we do here at Bristol Community College, we can continue to change the world, learner by learner. So thank you so much for your support. I'd also like to thank the Terezin Foundation and Mark Ludwig for their support of the Holocaust and Genocide Center. I look forward to these events every year. Uh, it's so wonderful to connect not only with history but also with culture and to understand a little bit more about what happened way back when and how we can use music as a way, as a vehicle really, to tell the story of the Holocaust. 
Uh, this is a very unique event that we're celebrating tonight. Uh, we not only have some original works, we have a, a poem, and all of this work is surrounding our very important work on the Button Project. And I hope that if you didn't have a chance when you came in and registered to see those wonderful portraits at the uh, entrance of our theater, I hope on the way out you'll take a moment to really get close to see how intricate the detail is. And we have more things to come with our button project as well. So thank you again for being here and for your support, not only for Bristol Community College, but for our Holocaust and Genocide Center. Thank you. Boy, I got these lights here. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to, something I wanted to mention too is that we have a wonderful collection as part of our Holocaust Center in the library, right? nearly a thousand books and it's still growing and that's because of the work of Emily Brown and the library. Um, so th thank you. It's a unique, in some way, I mean in this region or maybe other, it's a real incredible resource. So I would urge any of you, if you have a chance, come to our library, you can borrow the books or read in there. But I know Emily's put in a lot of time and um, it's, um, again, part of what we do, uh, part of our services, really, are the Holocaust and Genocide Center to be a resource for folks. So, with all that, you know, I want to introduce Mark Ludwig, who has been such a great friend of our center. And we really appreciate it. And this is going to be a wonderful program. Thank you, Mark. So before we begin the program, I want to second the President's comments on acknowledging the importance of this center and also the vision of Ron. And you know, the, the manner in which, and I think all of you have experienced it in your own personal way, the manner he's conducted himself in you know, building this very special center. So on behalf of the Terrazine Music Foundation, we're proud to be in a long-standing partnership and we look forward to uh, future collaborations with the center. So, bravo, Ron. <clears throat> so this evening's program, The Children of the Shoah, draws inspiration from our book, Our Will to Live. And tonight, we're gonna share in the readings and artwork from Terrazine, but with the added dimension of performances by pianist Virginia Eskin. And Ginny and I have had a very long history of uh, championing this music. And uh, we've played it in so many parts of the United States. I mean, we've played it in, around the world and, and the recordings and performances. Um, I feel we're very fortunate that she can be part of this program. So please welcome Virginia Askin. <laughs> And I think an added dimension to, to tonight is that we will conclude the program with the premiere of Ari Sussman's Not Say a Word for Solo Piano. But, so tonight we're remembering both the artists of Terezin, but also the one and a half million Jewish children murdered in the Holocaust. And I think what we should first start before we get into the music, give some of you, because some of you may be familiar with Terezin to some degree, but what was Terezin and, and how did that culture of music and the arts somehow develop in a concentration camp of all places? So Terezin is located 60 kilometers northwest of Prague. And on October 10th, 1780, the Emperor Franz Josef II laid the cornerstone of what would be two fortresses, a large and a small, and this was to protect the Austro-Hungarian Empire from Prussian armies. But with its diminishing military role, the large fortress became a quaint garrison town. And as you can see, in, in this turn of the century, it's a very charming postcard. You can see the barracks, there's the church steeple, there's the central square. But the small fortress served a much darker purpose holding political and military prisoners like Soviet POWs from World War I, and most notably, Gabriel Princip, the assassin of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In late fall of 1941, 
The Nazis selected the large fortress as quote unquote a ghetto settlement for Czech Jews as exemplified by this work of art by a prisoner. So like the postcard, he includes the same landmarks, the church steeple and barracks, but he places them within the camp's walls in the shape of a Jewish star. And the first transport of 342 Jewish men arrived to convert a garrison town of 7,500 people into a concentration camp that at one point held over 63,000 prisoners. So Terezin's purpose expanded in scope and scale. Jews within the German Reich and occupied countries were sent to Terezin and ultimately to the east for extermination. In addition to serving as a labor transit camp, Terezin later became a powerful propaganda vehicle for the Nazis, who labeled Terezin a paradise ghetto. In 1944, they forced the prisoners to produce and participate in two propaganda projects, a staged International Red Cross Committee visit and the propaganda film survivors called The Fuhrer Gives the Jews a City. So this drawing was one of a series of staged scenes for Terezin beautification that included an outdoor concert pavilion for bands like the ghetto swingers seen in this propaganda still, as well as facades of storefronts and a bank. This is a photo of a transport entering Terezin and prisoners would carry bundles of up to 50 kilos. And just for a moment, I want you to imagine for yourself in that photograph, had you been in an occupied German land and you had been isolated as a Jew, and now you're being sent to this unknown destination called Terezino Theresienstadt, what would you carry with you? Beyond food, medications, the essentials like clothing. And what I find really remarkable is many amateur and professional musicians chose to smuggle in musical instruments. This was perilous as the Nuremberg racial laws forbade the ownership of instruments by Jews. And these are among, and I'm going to emphasize this, hundreds of thousands of confiscated instruments. I want you to think about the logistics. So if you had a cello, amateur or professional, and you wanted to smuggle in it, how do you smuggle a cello in? And just imagine would you, you cut up your instrument, you put it into pieces, and you put it into the lining of your coat. And then you get it into the camp, you glue it back together. Right? That unto itself is amazing, but you know, think of the peril, because if you were discovered bringing this instrument in early on, you you're, have an immediate death sentence, you're sent to the east. So at first, prisoners secretly held informal concerts in the barracks. And becoming aware of these activities, the Nazis swung between periods of prohibition and indifference, eventually co-opting them for their propaganda purposes. With the growing number of transports, a remarkable and unparalleled cultural community developed amidst the daily reality of starvation, disease, lack of adequate medical care, and overcrowding where over 33,000 prisoners died. So my challenge in not only writing our world to live, but you know, for an audience like you tonight, is to find a way to bring you into this rich world while avoiding the pitfalls of a rather dry, scholarly, fact-laden account of this community. And how could I bring these artists out of the shadow of distant memory? And I believe I found this through the Terezin concert critiques and writings of Victor Ullmann, a composer and prisoner. He would be our guide, much like the poet Virgil was to Dante, in his divine comedy, taking us into an unimaginable world. Further enriching that experience is artwork that we'll see that was created by the prisoners, documenting the cultural activities, and they're part of some 500 works collected by this man, Carl Hermann, who was a member of Terezin's Jewish administrative leadership. So imagine in October of 1944, Hermann and Ullmann, they received transport notices to Auschwitz. And both men made fateful decisions to leave their most valued possessions behind. Ullmann entrusted his manuscripts to a friend while Hermann hid the artwork under the floorboards and the walls of the barracks. Miraculously, they were recovered after the war. 
But before sampling the music and, and, and the excerpts from Oman's critiques with artwork and music, I'd like to touch on Oman and the scope of his critiques, especially with the fact that you're going to hear some of his music tonight. This is Oman sitting at the 50th birthday celebration of his mentor, Arnold Schoenberg. And he was part of Schoenberg's Viennese circle. I love this photograph because you look at this young man, he's got a bit of that smile. You know, it's that he has his whole life ahead of him. It's filled with promise, right? And in fact, in the 1920s and 30s, he was already carving out a rather distinguished career as a composer, pianist, and conductor. He was deported in, to Terezin on September 8, 1942, where he soon became a towering cultural figure as a composer and producer of chamber concerts. This is a program in Terezin, and here he is, he's the director of the studio for new music. Now, we find fascinating on two fronts. Uh, he studied and rubbed shoulders with Zemlinsky, Schoenberg, and Haba. Right. So already he has his own personal connection to these composers on the program. The other thing is that in Nazi Germany and occupied lands, a term called degenerate music, which was basically music that was deemed degenerate because it was Jewish or it was atonal and therefore Jewish and Bolshevik or considered jazz as Negro music. This was music banned and yet here is all the band music, and of all things, surrealistically, it's being performed in this concentration camp. So, Ullmann, he wrote about stagings, but his critiques, you know, they, they, of, of operas, but more importantly, he draws us into the performances held within the barracks. And he wrote about the stagings of Tusca and Fledermaus, to name a few. And I'll caution you when I say that he wrote about them and that there were opera productions, it's not the type of opera production we're used to with the elaborate sets and costumes. If you can see, this is in the Hamburg barracks. So in place of a pit orchestra, there was usually a piano reduction. If there were any costumes, it was made with any materials that are around, the scraps, maybe burlap, paper, wire, whatever they could put together. Uh, look at the seating. These are benches. That would be the comfortable seating. A lot of people stood up, and it was usually in the attic or the basements of the barracks. So if you can imagine, with no heating system, no air conditioning, unbearably hot in the summer, unbelievably cold in the winter. Ullmann described instrumental and vocal recitals, choral and chamber works. His critiques introduce us to inspiring musicians who brought their fellow prisoners hope and a momentary escape from despair. So, in one of his critiques, and this is one of them, this one happens to be typed, which was really unusual in the camp, to have access to a typewriter. <clears throat> but a lot of them he also rewrote by hand. And it was a one-off. It wasn't like he had access to a lot of paper or pen, pencil, or typewriters. So he had to collect his thoughts and basically put it down. It was a one-shot operation. And in this critique, which was titled Piano Evening with Elise Herzomer, Ullmann dispenses a bit of counsel. And he writes the following. Lastly, a word to our pianists. We absolutely respect the commendable competitive fervor for which they present us the romantic composers. So these are the standard war horses. But he goes on to write, however, there are a large number of composers who deserve our interest, not only because they may happen to be Jews, but also because they have talent and genius and are still not performed in the surrounding world. So he's already, even in the camp, but to us for future generations, saying we should be listening to the music of our time period. And then he goes on to recommend a long list of composers, some that we know, you know Mendelssohn, Schoenberg, Bloch, uh, Kurt Weill, and then there's one, Erwin Schulhoff. And he concludes this little mini crusade of his writing, I could name many, many more, and I haven't even mentioned the Theresienstadt composers, and I think that all of them have written interesting works for piano. So as I mentioned, he, he notes Schulhoff and this evening, we're going to start the program with Schulhoff, who was a Czech composer and pianist, 
And I want to give you just a little brief background on him. He has a fascinating history. <clears throat> so Schulhoff was among the most promising musical talents of the early 20th century. He twice won the prestigious Mendelssohn Prize, first in composition and then in piano performance. In World War I, he was wounded while serving on the Russian front and he was imprisoned in an Italian POW camp. The great suffering that Schulhoff witnessed reshaped his music and politics, and he declared, quote, my music and communism are inseparable. His compositions reflect his political leanings as well as the musical and cultural trends of the 20s and 30s, and he was especially influenced by jazz. And Schulhoff's most fervent political declaration resulted in this music here. This is the sheet music to his 1932 cantata set to the Communist Manifesto. Now, I love Schulhoff's music, but I will tell you this is not going to be one of them. And, and a lot of times we will find when a composer and artist is subservient to a sort of a political agenda, their art suffers, their voice suffers. But Schulhoff, for him, unfortunately, he, he was trapped in Prague in 1941. He had obtained Soviet citizenship for himself, his wife, and his son. This is his son, Petra. But their plans to emigrate were dashed with the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. He was immediately arrested. And Schulhoff, he was a triple target because one, he's carrying a Soviet passport. His music was labeled degenerate and subversive and he was of Jewish background. So Schulhoff and Petra were sent to the Würzburg concentration camp, <clears throat> and Schulhoff died there of tuberculosis on August 18, 1942. I happen to own this piece of artwork. This is, port this is a portrait from uh, Petra. He drew this of his father on his deathbed in the camp. And after holding his dying father in his arms, Petra was forced to dig the grave of his father. At the time, Schulhoff no and Ullmann, at this very time that he died, Ullmann had noted Schulhoff in his critique. And it so happened that Schulhoff's father was also in Terezin. But strangely, neither knew that Erwin had already died in that lager camp. So I feel for tonight, it's very appropriate that Ginny is going to perform, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is the wrong slide, but she is going to perform the ostinato by Erwin Schulhoff, and it's a set of pieces that were built around the birth of his son, Petra. And, and they have beautiful titles, Mama and Papa, all right? And, and there's, there's a childhood playfulness about it, and it shows the strong bond between father and son already through his music.
So I love the playfulness of those little vignettes. I, and when I'm listening to Virginia, I was thinking of my seven-year-old's room with all his toys. Like, they have their own world. And, and for what Ullmann does in this music, he takes you into the world of his son Petra at the time he was writing that, he was a child. And so there's such a beautiful playfulness about that piece. And you know, in a lot of Schulhoff's music, especially the jazz-infused pieces, he does have a very playful character about him. So in our program, we're now gonna to switch to a Terezin composer, Gideon Klein. <clears throat> and you'll notice when I introduce each of the composers on a program, one of the tragic things is, of course, you see those dates. And, well, in Schulhoff's case, he died in his mid-40s, and Klein's murdered in his mid-20s. But Klein, this is somebody special. He was among many of Terezin's young and up-and-coming talents that appear throughout Ullmann's critiques. And in this critique, <clears throat> Ullmann writes with a mix of admiration, suggestions, and sometimes friendly, almost playful admonishments. In one critique, tinged with an ominous undercurrent, Ullmann writes the following. The peculiar fate of our chamber music societies, and when he says societies, he means ensembles, has the quality of a meteor. It briefly flashes promisingly and then disappears. In each case, it is only to be desired that it may be different this time. And this time it would be particularly disappointing if there would be only a promise without a consequence. Gideon Klein was certainly a meteoric talent. <clears throat> Incarcerated in Terezin in his early 20s, he was a piano prodigy, composer, conductor, and educator. Klein secretly taught the children in the camp in studies of literature and in music. And several survivors reminisced, quote, Gideon was our young Leonard Bernstein. From the critique titled Gideon Klein Piano Evening, Ullmann writes, Klein shows that the pianist can refrain from displaying a cheap yet brilliant apotheosis of his virtuosity and still achieve a well-deserved success. Gideon Klein is without a doubt a very important talent. His style is that of the new youth, cool and objective. Our youth has strong intelligent brains. Hopefully they can lift the heart up into the head. In the critique number 21, which is titled Gideon Klein, Paul Klein, Friedrich Mark Piano Trio, and this is a poster in Terezin of that ensemble, he writes, the performance is remarkable due to the superb rehearsing Gideon Klein devoted to it. He masters even the difficult piano passages with energy and reliable stylistic insight. Kling had a very successful debut on the violin. He is on the right path and talented. Friedrich Mark has often proved himself to be a superb musician. <clears throat> Kling and Mark appear with Klein in this photograph, which was taken in occupied Prague. And to circumvent the Nuremberg, Nuremberg racial laws prohibiting Jews from public performances, they took on stage names. Klein would later compose two string compositions for these friends of his in Terezin. So Klein's performances extended beyond the solo and chamber repertoire. There were the famous Verdi Requiem performances in Terezin. And this is a, a sketch of Edgar Crossa, who sang in the chorus for those Verdi Requiem performances. And over the years, Edgar and I, we did well over 150, 160 Holocaust education programs in the United States and in Europe. And <clears throat> here's an excerpt from my book where Edgar recounts these performances because he really draws us into the world of Terezin and what it took to put the Verdi Requiem performances together. The following. Imagine Jews in a concentration camp singing a Roman Catholic mass in Latin. The council of elders had mixed feelings about this undertaking. I was part of the first 150 member chorus that rehearsed the Requiem at the end of each day. Each night, we gathered in the cellar. There were no parts, only the score. We learned this from memory. After six weeks of rehearsals, 
news spread through the camp that there would be a major transport to the east on September 6th. There was a performance for family members and shortly afterwards, over half the choir was lost to the transport. <clears throat> Schechter recruited another choir. It again was decimated by transports. In January 1944, we gave the official premiere of the Requiem. We sang the Requiem 15 more times. On June 23rd, 1944, Schechter was ordered by the SS Commandant in Terrazine to give a performance of the Requiem for the visiting Red Cross Committee. Ullmann attended at least one of these performances and he wrote the following. It seems justified to emphasize once again that Raphael Schechter, the choral master, and to whom the musical life of Theresienstadt owes so many artistic achievements, managed to put together a performance at the level of the Metropolitan Standard. The choir is not only precise, but also dynamically impeccable. We'll remember this glorious production with Gideon Klein at the piano with gratitude. So, I dare say a number of you have probably attended a performance of the Verdi Requiem, and for those who, who haven't, I want you to imagine you're in a concert hall with a full orchestra, like 100 people on stage. You have a choir of at least 150 people. And then usually in the balconies, they, have, they call them banda, but they're um, brass choirs. <clears throat> so this is really a um, staggering proportion, all right? Try to imagine Klein is playing for you in place of the orchestra, all right? They're, they're crammed into the basement of the barrack to try to prepare this requiem. And here's just a page from that score. Now, even if you can't read music, you see all those notes on there? There are a lot of notes on that page, all right? It gives you a sense there's a lot going on in the score. Well, I want you to hear a pianist who tries to play part of this page, and it gives you an idea of what Klein was trying to do to replicate these huge forces just on a broken down piano in the camp. pretty impressive, right? Can you imagine he's doing this for an hour? And he's reading off of a score, and he's got to condense a whole page after page of this thick orchestration with a choir and four soloists and trying to do the piano reduction and rehearsing at the end of the day in a concentration camp. I mean, that's staggering talent to me. <clears throat> so Ullmann, he he never writes about any of the compositions. He doesn't, in his critiques, it doesn't, anything is written about what Klein composed, but yet, in the concert series in the camp, Ullmann selects a work by Klein. And in fact, if you look, the title is Young Composers in Theresienstadt. So it already gives you a sense that Ullmann held Klein's talent in great regard. And his, one of his real masterpieces was his piano sonata written in Terezin in 1943. And Virginia is now about to perform that three movement piece, which is so dramatic, so lyrical, so dark and yet beautiful, very captivating. Um, it really gives you a strong sense of this phenomenal talent.
one may wonder that being both critic and composer, would there be a potential conflict of interest, thereby questioning Victor Ullmann's journalistic integrity? But as a further sign of his character, there is only one entry regarding his music among his 26 Terrazine critiques. And it happens to be a grateful acknowledgement at the very end of one critique where he writes, the best praise of the critic is probably that he heard his own arrangements of Hebrew melodies performed impeccably. And our program is on the children of the Shoah. And I thought, concluding the historic segment before the Ari Sussman uh, commission premiere was to go and have Ullman in the focus of the story of his children. Because in that set of choral arrangements that he writes about in Terezin, his son Maximilian sang in the choir. And <clears throat> this is a photo of Ullman's children, left to right are Maximilian, Felicia, and Johannes. And one can only imagine how deeply emotional this performance was for Ullman. So for me as a parent, one of the most emotionally difficult sections in writing this book was the following excerpt. Being quarantined with a case of the measles, Max was unable to join the kinder transport. He and his mother, Anna, were then sent from Prague to Terezin on May 7, 1942. Johannes and Felicia, seen in this photograph, were separated shortly after their arrival in the UK. These four separations, followed by news of their family members' deaths in Auschwitz, would improve, it would prove an enduring trauma for both children in what may be a case of both bureaucratic and medical malpractice. Johannes was institutionalized in a mental hospital in 1948 where he was heavily medicated and given insulin shock therapy. He was in several institutions until his death in 2010 in a hospital for homeless men. There is very little record of Felicia's fate other than just she was adopted by a childless couple and she died of cancer in 2004. Felicia and her brother Johannes were not reunited until he attended her funeral. Ullmann's last work was his piano sonata number no. seven dated Terezin, August 22nd, 1944 and it was dedicated to these three children. So, I want to take an earlier piano sonata of Ullmann's, and it's a movement from it's Sonata Number no. Two, Opus 19. It's a set of variations on a theme by Leos Janacek, and there is a playfulness about it, but then it gets very dark, and it shows the wide range of Ullmann's imagination through these set of variations. <laughs>
I want to thank you all for joining us in this program tonight. And again, um, salute Ron for all his wonderful work. And to salute all of you for supporting his vision. And may you continue to do that in the years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>